Welcome everybody to Music Off the Record. I am Dr. Ken Owen. We're here at Pierce College talking about the music that will be on the next Northwest Sinfonietta concert, which is titled Brahms and Beethoven. Does everyone know which one's which? Pardon Mr. Beethoven. We all kind of recognize that one, don't we? All right. So um, it's going to be an exciting concert if you're able to go to that concert. Uh, it's our first one with uh, Joseph Swenson here, who he will perform the, well, the first piece there we're going to talk about is the Brahms Violin Concerto, which uh, Joey Swenson will conduct from the violin. So I'm really excited to hear him and, and hear that. So let's learn a little bit about the music. <clears throat> First, Brahms. This is uh, a little a picture of a little bit of uh, the Violin Concerto. Sometimes it makes you wonder how they were able to read things like that. Composed 1878. First uh, performance in 1879, just to kind of give you a feel for when things are going on. So, I have a little quiz for you, just to keep your, make sure you're awake as we get going. Which is true of Brahms in his younger days? Was he A, the son of a wealthy banker who was given every educational opportunity? Or was he B, a child prodigy composing and performing from eight years old? Or was he C, the son of a poor musician played, who had to play in bars as a youth to help su supplement the family income? Or was he the son of a schoolmaster, which is what, kind of like a principal, who uh, was trained as a school teacher? What do you think? Which one was Brahms? All for A? Nobody for A? All for B? Nobody going for B? All for C? I've got two for C. All for D? All right, people are going for D. Let's see if we can see the answer. Uh, can you see the answer? All right. <laughs> Brahms was the son of a very poor musician. Uh, his father played double bass uh, in the town orchestra, did not make a lot of more money in the Hamburg uh, Philharmonic Society. This is where they lived. They were on the second floor. That's where the Red Arrow is pointing to. Not the whole second floor, part of the second floor. An apartment on there is where they lived. Um, and Brahms turned out to be quite a talented young musician from a young age, particularly a pianist. He was very methodical, would sit down and practice like, you know, like all of his piano teachers want all of our students to practice, but so few of them do it that way. <laughs> he did do it that way. He was sat down and practiced methodically and diligently and was a talented young musician. But because the family was so hard up for cash, he ended up helping supplement by getting a job, playing the piano. Well, the place that you could do that would be playing in the taverns. Now, where they lived was along the waterfront. Um, and so that means the people coming in are sailors. So think late 1800s, the sailors coming in, what kind of places these likely are. This is not a good environment for a young man to, uh, you know, for a young man to be in. Um, you know, we're talking these bars are also brothels and, and uh, Brahms taught, you know, for the rest of his life, struggled in his relationship with women and he, relationships with women. He attributed it to some of the experiences that he had in here. He apparently was sometimes grabbed by the women and pulled up on stage and, and you know, made the brunt of jokes and stuff like this. So he had some pretty horrible things in that job that uh, kind of messed him up a little bit as far as how he felt um, about relationships with women, unfortunately. Uh, he never did get married, and uh, there is the whole Clara Schumann thing, which is a topic for another day. All right, so as he gets a little older, finally is able to leave home and get out of that situation, uh, he heads uh, to Austria, heads to Vienna, I mean, and he meets a violinist, fantastic violinist from Hungary named Josef Joachim, uh, when Brahms is 20. Portrait of him there. Joachim is a couple years older, but by contrast to Brahms, he has already, is already well known and recognized as a you know, fantastic violinist. He debuted with the London Philharmonic with Mendelssohn as the conductor when he was 14 years old. So he's a big shot. This, this Joachim is doing great. And he meets young Brahms and is quite impressed by the young pianist and writes him a letter of recommendation to meet with Robert Schumann. Now the reason that that's such a big deal is because Robert Schumann um, is a uh, is a publisher of a periodical, a, a music journal, as it were, that uh, reviews music, particularly new compositions, but, but other things as well. And so Schumann gets this letter from uh, Joachim, who he knows. He's a close friend of the Schumanns. Uh, and so he listens to Brahms, looks at some of his music, and recognizes right away what a brilliant young man this is. And he just 
writes a publication just raving about this is the next Beethoven. If he ever conjures up a symphony, it's going to be exactly what we need to have come after, after uh, Beethoven. So there's just a picture of that periodical um, Neue Zeitschrift for Music or the New Journal for Music that Schumann was uh, writing in. So when he uh, writes this rave review about how wonderful Brahms is, this terrifies Brahms. <laughs> Great, what am I going to publish now? Everybody's expecting the next Beethoven out of me. Um, and uh, it really does make it a hard time for him. He's already a little bit insecure. He ends up uh, throwing a lot of music in the fire because he's worried it's not good enough. Um, and we'll talk more about some of that result of that intimidation later. So anyway, we get this friendship between Brahms, um, this violinist, Joachim, and uh, the Schumanns. And in fact, we see portraits of them, early photograph here of uh, of uh, Brahms, and um, Brahms is the one sitting down, and Joachim is the one standing up, and then the artist's portrait of Joachim playing the violin with Clara Schumann there at the piano. And they would perform together quite regularly, do a lot of things together. They were um, close friends. And especially with the Schumanns, he became lifelong friends, and they all did, like we said, regular collaborations. So that's Robert and Clara Schumann. After Robert died, uh, Brahms and Clara stayed quite close, correspondents throughout their lives. There's always the question of how much romantic feeling there was there, but nothing that ever was, was acted upon, certainly, that we know of. Anyway, <clears throat> so Brahms uh, and symphonies was the big scary thing, right? Schumann says, here's the person to write the next symphony, the next symphony after Beethoven, because Beethoven had really changed the symphony. Now that we've had Beethoven and his symphonies, what do we do now? This, this is really intimidating, not just to Brahms, to all composers. And Brahms, uh, well, in fact, none of the composers write more than nine symphonies for nearly 100 years. It's this, suddenly we have this big intimidating thing there. And Brahms doesn't even give us his first symphony until he's 40 years old. There's a couple of times that he tries and changes it and turns it into a piano concerto or those sort of things. So by the time he's 40, he finally launches his first symphony, and uh, it goes well. It's great. Um, and this is when the conductor of that performance coins that phrase. You've heard of the three Bs, the three great Bs of music, Bach, Beethoven, and Brahms. This comes about from the conductor of the premiere of the first symphony. That's where we get that coin termed, and people have been saying it ever since, the three Bs. So right away, he gets started on his second symphony and our violin concerto. So it's after that success of his first symphony. He's in his 40s, gaining a little confidence and uh, going for it. So of course, for the soloist, he does intend for that friend, Josef Joachim, to be the violinist. Now, Brahms is not a string player. He does not play the violin. Now, there's always, as a composer, that concern of wanting to, you know, when you're playing something that's really supposed to be virtuosic, something that's supposed to be, you know, a, a wonderful technical piece for an instrument of knowing how to make sure you write for that instrument well if you don't play it. You know, am I writing things that can't be played physically? That sort of thing. So he worked with Joachim throughout the process. He, he would write things and send them to Joachim, even when they weren't in the same town. If Joachim was off performing concerts throughout Europe, he would send letters and say, you know, take a look at this part. And Joachim would, would you know, write suggested revisions and send them back. So you can't do this. You can do this, but it's awkward. Try this instead. Um, and uh, sometimes Brahm would take his suggestions, and sometimes he wouldn't. Oh, you said you could do it. It's, I don't care if it's awkward. You said you could do it. I want it this way. <laughs> and so they would go back and forth. In fact, they were still working on this and revising back and forth the night of the premiere, <laughs> arguing over whether this should be this way or that way. Uh, and even afterwards, they continued to change it uh, for the next year after its original premiere. Um, particularly in the cadenza and some of the things, but we won't worry about that too much. Brahms ends up saying this, well, how much more agreeable and sensible it is to write for an instrument one knows thoroughly, as I presume to know the piano. So a uh, bit of an ordeal for him, I guess. Um, now, as far as some of the ideas for the concerto, he takes some ideas from Joachim as well, who had written a concerto of his own. He called the Hungarian concerto. Now, realizing Germany, where the greatest the musical stuff was going on, and all composers wanted to head to Germany and Vienna and Austria, that area, the German-speaking countries. For them, Hungary meant gypsy, which of course wasn't true, but that was the stereotype, and, and Hungarian violinists like Joachim would capitalize on that, right? 
because anything that was Hungarian was exotic and exciting. And so he writes a concerto and calls it a Hungarian concerto. Um, and this catches the attention of the Viennese public who think this is very exotic and exciting. And so uh, Brahms uh, copies that idea a little bit for his third movement in which he imitates a little bit of this gypsy fiddling sort of sound. Uh, and uh, we'll kind of hear some of that in a moment. So. The other thing with his concerto that's a little different is the concept of a concerto in Brahms' time was really all about showing off. I mean, we had people like Liszt, who, you know, writing piano concertos, it was all about the piano. The orchestra's there, sure, but they're just kind of backup. You know, they're not really that big a deal. Um, and, you know, we had Paganini, who would play a violin concerto, and he'd make the orchestra play down in the pit like an opera and stand up on the stage all by himself. You know, they're playing a few chords. They're not doing anything <laughs> major. It's all about the violin, right? But Brahms doesn't do that. Brahms really writes, you know, quite symphonically for the orchestra, and it plays a real major part in this. It's not soloist and backup. It's a real, you know, collaborative thing. Um, let's, in fact, hear a little bit of that and see if you can hear what I mean by the symphonic nature of the orchestra part. So you can hear a lot of typical Brahms things, some really you know, quite a thick, dense texture going on, some different colors going on. I mean, this isn't just plain, you know, boring background for the orchestra to play down in the pit while the soloist shows off. This is, you know, his typical stuff going on. Complex rhythms, layers, all kinds of things. So at this point, this could be a symphony as far as how this sounds. It's, you know, quite full. Um, however, the problem was, oh, it's not advancing. Give me a second here. The problem is the audience didn't like that. They liked the way that Paganini was doing it. We wanted to see the show off. We wanted to see the, you know, the person who was a little bit of a freak of nature that could do things that were amazing that the rest of us can't do. Uh, and so that was something that was actually criticized, so much so that Brahms, who had started on a second violin concerto, kind of saw this reaction that people didn't like it. They said, oh, there's too much orchestra in the way um, that he actually took that second violin concerto he's working on and chucked it in the fire, and that was it, and we don't have it. If only he could have seen now on how that concerto has lasted as one of the major concertos of the repertoire, maybe we would have had another one. <laughs> The fools who uh, criticized them ruined it for us. Um, so the, that first movement, actually we didn't even hear the soloist at all. Maybe let's hear just a little bit more of the first movement before we talk about the second so we can hear that it is actually a violin concerto.
skip a little bit. So we get our violin in there. A little further still. All right, so we'll go ahead and move on. Um, but I've I've had probably the professional somebody like Swenson would not say this, but student friends when I was uh, at university who are violinists who would say that there are parts of it that seem like maybe somebody who wasn't the violinist wrote it, you know, things that are a little bit difficult to play. And there are parts, I think, that uh, were for a long time played the way that Joachim suggested and then some have often played now back the way that Brahms originally had written. But I understand there was just to, to kind of understand what I'm talking about if you don't play an instrument. Um, I'm a pianist. My bachelor's degree is in piano performance. And where I did my undergraduate, we did some music um, in the choir there that had been written by a choir director who had been at that university who had only a left hand. He was just born without a right arm. And uh, so this conductor had done some arrangements of show tunes that were done that were, that were lovely. And the piano part, though, the left hand played very well. But the right hand was always a little awkward because you know your hands have thumbs on opposite sides. <laughs> and so you play it, and there's this gap between your thumb and your finger that fit just fine left hand. But when you're playing with your right hand, there was this big gap between your pinky and your fourth finger in all these chords because he wrote it with his left hand trying it out and then writing it down. And so are these things that were awkward until you tried playing it with your left hand, and then it worked just fine. So, you know, there can be things if you don't play an instrument that are like that that don't sound complicated to us, and the violinist just has to, to deal with it, but can be um, a little bit difficult. All right, moving on to our second movement. This starts out softly with very much the sound of a chorale, and by that I mean like a, a hymn. Um, and Brahms had spent a lot of time studying the music of Bach, you know, a lot of Lutheran chorales uh, with, you know, pristine following of rules of writing, everything, and he does a little bit of this. He starts out with this Bach-like hymn sound. So we're gonna jump to that. Do you hear what I mean? It just kind of sounds like a very straightforward four-part hymn. And then when the violin enters in a moment, it's just this exquisite moment as it enters up high with this kind of floating down from above sort of sound that Brahms loves to do and just is always exquisite. Jerky there on the streaming.
There's this wonderful Brahms moment. Brahms tends to do this, write stuff like the first movement that's thick and heavy and dark and struggling. And then after all that, he brings in this incredibly peaceful stuff. And often with these kind of high, you know, as if it were floating down from heaven sort of things that come floating down like that. And it's just gorgeous. Love that second movement. Into the third, and this is where we get the ideas from Joachim for the gypsy fiddling sort of thing. This is where he takes on that idea. Now, there is a recurring theme that keeps coming back. The form of this is called a rondo, which just means that, that we have a recurring theme that we get, and then we get something else, and then we get that recurring theme that comes back again, and then something else, and then that theme, that rondo theme comes back. And one of the things that we get in the violin solo is what is called double stops. Now, this just means that the violin, which usually plays one note at a time, plays two notes at a time. So you see the violin part up there and how there's two notes at a time, sometimes four. For four, they actually do have to roll across and get all those. But playing the two notes at a time is kind of a fiddling sort of sound, especially in this way that he does it, this sort of gypsy fiddling sound. And so that's one of the things that we get. And the other thing, well, let's maybe listen to that first, and then we'll point out the other thing. Here we go. So you hear that kind of that digging into both of those notes at the same time. It, gives, it makes it a little bit rougher, that digging into it, and has that kind of gypsy, or at least what they would have thought of as gypsy, kind of exciting, exotic sound. And then the orchestra picks up that thing. Right, we're just about to launch into this bottom musical example, if you can see up here, which is another typical Brahms thing where he sets up uh, what we call a hemiola. In other words, it's going to feel like suddenly your, your beat is misplaced. That we have this dum, da 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 dum, two, one, and two, and dun, da da dun, da da. Suddenly things are going to feel in the wrong meter. If you try to tap your foot to it as I carry on, you'll find places that you feel like you're off. Feels wrong. So we get that kind of disrupted sort of meter as it carries on. Those contrasting uh, sections, in other words, remember we have that recurring theme. In between that, we get a couple of different things happening. One is this where the solace even has to play further apart double stops, sweeping up these big romantic, leaves the gypsy idea for a little bit in these big romantic sweeps that are more Brahms-like, uh, and then goes back to that A theme. And then we get this very lyrical, beautiful melody, and then back to that A theme. So we might see if we can bounce around and hit a couple of those things, but it's great stuff. Upward sweep. Doesn't really sound fiddle like anymore. And we're back. There's that double stop theme again, A that comes back. It'll play, and here's this C section, the, another alternating. Again, we leave the gypsy fiddling idea and have this beautiful Brahms melody.
and it'll make its way back to that same A theme again and then keep going. So you can kind of hear that double stop theme keep coming back if you're able to go to the concert. I can just see the two of them, can't you, right the night before the concert? I, I still don't like this note, Brahms. It's just awkward. How about we change it to this? Well, can you play it? Well, yeah, but I don't like it. Well, if you can play it, play it. <laughs> but it doesn't work very well. I don't know. I can imagine the, the arguments going back and forth. So a little brain teaser for you. All right. There are numbers up here. Haydn, 108. Mozart, 41 plus. Beethoven, 9. Schubert, 9-ish. Schumann, 4. Berlioz, oops, I left the number off. 4 for Berlioz. Brahms, 4. Tchaikovsky, 6. What is it? What are we talking about? What's the number? Number, number of symphonies they composed, right. Yes. 108, but 104 of them survive. There's, there's a few of them that we know are lost, uh, and so some of them even get numbered 108, even though there isn't technically 108 that we have now. Uh, likewise, why I say 41 plus, because Mozart actually wrote around 68, but if you take away the ones that he wrote as a little kid that don't really get performed anymore, and some others that didn't really ever get beyond a pencil sketch, we get to 41 that are you know, real symphonies that get performed a lot. Um, Schubert 9-ish because he wrote kind of a 10th one and maybe even 11th one, but he didn't count them himself. He said, no, no, those don't count <laughs> because they were student ones or what have you. Um, even the unfinished symphony that's number nine had several different numbers throughout history. In Brahms' time, it would have been thought of as his seventh symphony and things like this. But anyway, big deal is that Beethoven really change this concept of what a symphony is and what the genre is, which is part of why we have this drastic difference in numbers, right? I mean, it would seem like, so, so Haydn and Mozart know what they're doing, and what's the problem with the rest of them? <laughs> why can't they put out any more than this? Not very productive. These are not good composers. <laughs> not really what's going on. What's happened is Beethoven really changed the concept of what the symphony is. The only reason Mozart wrote so much fewer than Haydn is because he lived half as long, wrote half as many. If he'd lived as long as Haydn, he would have written just as many or more. Uh, Beethoven does live a lot longer than Mozart, but writes so few because it's an entirely different concept. Um, it's not just this quick made-to-order thing for somebody to get the paycheck, basically. Now this is this deeply expressive, personal thing that you work on for a big chunk of your life and do. Um, so, which Beethoven symphonies come to mind? You say Beethoven symphony, which are the numbers that you're most familiar with? Nine, I heard nine, five, three. three, all the odd numbers. Isn't that interesting? So the first one is not as known as much, but it is a little bit of pushing the envelope. Right from his very first symphony, a student of Haydn, he starts with this big dramatic dissonant chord. I mean, not super dissonant, but it's a dominant chord, a chord that Haydn would never start on. So he's already kind of pushing things a little bit. Second symphony, when was the last time you heard the second symphony? Not performed nearly as much, right? Then the third suddenly is huge, massive in size of orchestra and in length, and scope is this big, innovative, pushing the envelope thing. Then we get the fourth, and it's not this big, massive thing that the third is. It's more like a you know, typical Mozart symphony as far as size of the orchestra and, and scope. Certainly um, still more expressive, but again, we don't hear as much about it. It's not what people first think of. And then, of course, the fifth, the iconic symphony, where again, he's pushing the envelope. He adds instruments to the orchestra, things like trombones and piccolos and stuff like this that hadn't been in the symphony before. Um, and then we get the sixth, and it's this pastoral thing. It's, yeah, it's played a lot, but it's not the one that people first think of, like five. Seven, not as much. It breaks the pattern a little bit. Uh, it's not as big as three, five, and nine. Uh, but still, it's a little bit bigger than eight. And then, of course, nine just blows everything out of the water, right? Adding an entire choir and soloists and stuff. So he kind of has this pattern. We have big, innovative, bold, pushing the envelope symphonies on the odd numbers. And then on the evens, we tend to, he tends to pull back. Uh, and he kind of pulls back in the size of the orchestra, in the length. It's not that the music is any less sophisticated. It's just that it's like, all right, here's the, the big new ideas. And now let me take them and refine them. And, and tends to be a little bit more restrained and refined. Uh, in the way that he composes those. So the fourth symphony is what we're talking about today. So let's, let's see if we can figure out where this came from. A little less known about the origins and how this one came about than some of his other symphonies. So 1802, to put us in context, this is the date of the famous Heiligenstadt Testament. Does everybody know the Heiligenstadt Testament, what that is? Um, the one thing that everybody knows about Brahms is that he went 
deaf, right? Everybody, everybody always knows that about when he went deaf. Well, the, the losing his hearing was a gradual thing. He didn't wake up deaf one morning. He recognized that he was losing his hearing. He'd go to a doctor. We're talking the you know, 1700s. They would stick a leech on his head and hope that would help. <laughs> you know, there was not a lot that they could do. Finally, one of the doctors says, you know, you just need to save your hearing. Get out of the noisy city. Go out to the country. And so he goes to a town called Heiligenstadt, which is kind of this country resort town out there, and it's quiet. And that's the best medical advice he's gotten so far, <laughs> is go out where it's not so noisy and save your hearing. And while he's there and continues to lose his hearing, so it's gradual, less and less that he hears, um, he, he finally faces the fact that this isn't going away. And what am I going to do about it? And he writes this letter to his brothers, although it's really an interesting letter because to read it, he starts out to my brothers, Johann and Karl, uh, and then says, oh, ye men, you know, he's not really writing this to his brothers. As arrogant as it sounds, he knows the rest of us are going to reading, be reading it hundreds of years later. And he's right. And he writes it very much as if it were to society, talking about how, oh, you men who've you know, thought wrong of me and thought I was uh, you know, standoffish and arrogant when really I was just scared of being found out that me, who had the greatest hearing of all and sh who should have this great hearing, I can't hear what you're hearing. Um, and he talks about how it just gives him so much anxiety. He's afraid to talk to people. Uh, and so he hides away like a hermit. Um, and of course, then that makes him lonely and miserable and, and all this stuff. And he contemplates suicide in the letter. He talks about how, how he contemplates suicide, but then decides that he feels he has this art in him that he needs to give to humanity. And so he's going to keep living and keep composing, even though he's losing his hearing. So this is 1802 that this is all that he writes this. He's coming to, the, to grips with the fact that this hearing is not going to get any better. In fact, it's probably going to keep going. Um, in 1804, a couple years after that, he's decided to move on enough and gotten moving forward enough that he's back in Vienna. He's composing again. In fact, he started work on his one opera. And that opera seems to be taking the main focus of his life. And so he's not really doing much else compositionally, really small output, output com, um, comparatively. On top of that, he also has a, he's romantically pursuing a young widow. Uh, that also distracts him a little bit, <laughs> slows down the output. Um, she didn't, uh, didn't work out <laughs> for him, unfortunately. But um, so those two things are going on. We do get in 1804 a few sketches from the fourth movement, the last movement of the fourth symphony. That's the first music that we see from this symphony is during this time when he's primarily working on the opera and, and chasing after this young widow uh, and not writing much else. Um, and we don't see the rest of it until 1806, two years later. At 1806, he finishes the opera, and then he starts just going gangbusters, writing other stuff, and suddenly becomes very productive. Um, in fact, he writes to a friend, hardly have I completed one composition that I have already begun another, and talks about how he's doing three or four things all at the same time, um, which for you know, Haydn probably wouldn't have been a big deal, but for Beethoven, the way Beethoven writes, that's a fast pace. So at this point, 1806, he's writing the Violin Concerto, the Fourth Piano Concerto, and our Fourth Symphony. These are all going at once. So follows the pattern, right? We had the great big massive Third Symphony, the Eroica, the big heroic, big massive long thing. Um, and then he writes this Fourth Symphony that's much smaller, more refined. In fact, Schumann, we've already talked about Schumann, right? He's here writing uh, about Beethoven. It's Fourth Symphony, and he refers to it as the Greek-like slender one, <laughs> is how, how Schumann refers to the Fourth Symphony. So um, the beginning of it is interesting. Some of the things that he sets up that seems to be typical of what he's doing uh, in this time period. So this is billed as in B flat major. So our scale that we should be using. And he starts out with a slow introduction, which is not unusual. And the very first thing we hear that G flat does not fit. We should have. Should be what we have if it's B flat major. And instead he goes, ooh, right off the bat. Wait a minute. I thought you said this was major. This sounds minor. So are we in major or are we in minor? This seems to be typical. Around the same time period in this 1806 when he's starting to really get productive again, he writes uh, the Appassionata of his sonatas, and he does the same thing. It's supposed to be an F minor, and you get F minor. And 
And then right away he goes, wait a minute, that sounds major. What key are we in here? Are we in F minor or are we in G flat major? Because we've had equal treatment of both at this point, right? And then he slips back to F minor. But that note didn't fit. So anyway, he goes back and forth through this whole sonata. And same thing in our symphony, he's going to go in a slow introduction back and forth. Are we in minor or are we in major? Especially that very first surprising interval. And those two notes, or the relationship between those two notes, it's not blatantly obvious on the surface, but as you dig into the music, you see that's kind of a theme as he kind of bounces between music in one of those areas to the other. It's kind of a big deal. And we'll see, look at at least one more spot where we see that G flat creep in again to this B flat major. So let's listen to a little bit of it and hear that opening minor of our B flat major symphony. Sounding more major now. Ooh, there's the minor sound again. Major. So just like in that piano sonata, and I don't know if it's true or not, I had a piano professor that claimed that Beethoven would work out ideas in the piano sonatas and then do them in the symphonies. Um, so again, these, that sonata I was playing around the same time as the symphony, so whether he was working out in one going to the other or just that this is something that he was fascinated with is this playing back and forth between which mode are we in, minor or major, um, he's certainly doing it in both of these. So once he gets past that, uh, we launch into, so the first movement of symphonies, if they have a slow introduction, it's usually just the slow introduction, then it takes off into the more typical fast tempo. And this one does that. And by the time we get to that uh, fast tempo, um, we find out who wins, and it's the B flat major. on for now, but as you listen to it, whether you go to the concert or on your own, there might be a few G-flats that sneak back in there. You know, listen, there might be a few minor moments that you can come back in where he questions that as he goes throughout it. All right, on to the second movement. Beethoven, loving contrast, just like he loves the contrast between the major and the minor, he does a real contrast in articulation here. He sets up one theme in the second line down here. If you don't read music, don't worry about it. Just with all that black, realize that this is kind of a herky-jerky, duh. Da da, da da, rhythm. And then right over the top of it, you see in the, the top line where it says cantabile, which means singing, this very legato line at the same time. So it has these kind of two opposite, choppy and very smooth. And throughout this entire movement, it seems like there's always both going on. Uh, let's hear a little bit of that. Ch 
choppy little theme. So here underneath the ba -da -bum, little choppy theme still going. Skip ahead a little bit. I didn't quite find it there, but one of the other striking things about this, I think, is that Beethoven's not afraid to just bring it all down to one note at a time, and there's several places where it gets really sparse, and you'll have just, you know, one note at a time going before he starts to build it back up into big moments like we just heard there, and then it'll come back down to, to so little. So a little bit of that second movement. Third movement. Um, now, Beethoven messes with the structure that's expected of the symphony, uh, and you see him toying with it in here. He doesn't actually do it outright until the fifth symphony, and that is the third movement of a symphony is supposed to be a minuet. This is how symphonies work up until Beethoven. You have your first movement in sonata form, and this is that follows that. You have your second movement, movement that's going to be the slow and pretty one, like we just heard. And the third movement is supposed to be a minuet. Now, a minuet is a very aristocratic dance, right? It has to be in triple meter, and it's at a nice medium-ish tempo, not too fast, medium-slow tempo, uh, that, you know, the types in their white powdered wigs and, and big hoop skirts would, would do the, the royal dance to. And Beethoven certainly knows how to write minuets. This is a well-known one that you've probably heard. right? <laughs> and very delicate and proper, and this is a good minuet. Well, this third movement, it's a little chopped off, but the title, the tempo marking up there is Allegro Vivace. That's way too fast. You cannot dance a minuet at Allegro Vivace. And in the fifth movement, he'll go ahead and call it something else. Instead of calling it a minuet, he calls it a scherzo, which goes ahead and admits that this is no longer a minuet. It's something that's much more rough and more common man is kind of what he's going for and getting rid of this delicate aristocratic stuff. But we already see that going on here. It's not this kind of delicate, um, prissy minuet sound with your pinky up. It's too fast for that. Uh, also notice that it's fortissimo. It's this big loud sound uh, and we get, um, you know, oops. And then here's this G flat is going to sneak in here again. So right away we get B flat and then we get the G flat again. So once again he's playing with that. Which key are we in? Major or minor? And those two notes in particular, B flat to G flat. It's a far cry from the da 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 da, da little you know, pinky up tea drinking minuet sound, right? We're headed right for the fifth symphony's scherzo. He's already doing it in this fourth symphony. So we have that going on in there. Moving right along to our last movement, uh, which remember was conceived first. This is the first thing, at least that we can tell from his sketchbooks. This is what he was thinking of first. One of the things that's fun about this one is this perpetual motion feeling. Again, if you don't read music, just know that the more black there is, the faster the notes are going. <laughs> and uh, the, the top two lines, lots of notes going really fast. Now, by this 
last three majors, the top line has calmed down. But when that one calms down, this one is picked up to take up for it, right? To make up for it. And that's kind of how it goes throughout the entire movement. As soon as some instruments finally get to take a break, somebody else has to take over the job of going like crazy. Uh, and so it's just somebody's always moving like mad. And there's this constant perpetual motion sort of feel. If you can hear it, but it's still underneath there. It's still going. Now you can definitely hear it. You hear the lower winds? Still going. Somebody's still going like crazy. So there's just this kind of fun, constant, perpetual motion moving through it. Um, and really it has, even though this is the fourth symphony, which is the smaller, more restrained one, uh, it still has this big, you know, triumphant ending, uh, just like the third symphony, but without having to have quite so much to accomplish it. He does less with more in the, four, in the generally in the even symphonies, right? He makes a big statement with it, the odd number symphonies, and then he says, okay, now see if I can do that, do less is more in the next symphony, and do just as much with less. And he kind of does that in number three and has this wonderful, big, triumphant ending. Although you'll see we have some minor moments. We shouldn't listen for them. They're still there. All right. Questions, comments about the Fourth Symphony or Beethoven? Or about Northwest Symphonietta? We have Neil here if we need to ask him any questions. First time we get to hear this one of, our, of all of our artistic partners. This is the one we haven't heard yet. And so it'll be exciting. So I can't wait to hear the concert. I'll see you there. Thank you.